Yes. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? <laughs> that guy switched companies, didn't he, recently? So. And I'm just waiting on Bill. There we go. Please join me in prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just come before you, Lord. We pray that you'd remove any distractions or anything that's not of you. And help us, Lord, to hear what the Spirit has to say to us today. Each of us, Lord, needs to hear from you. And I just pray that we'd leave here today uh, just encouraged and exhorted to know that you're the God that reigns on high and that you have a great eternal plan for all of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So Steve did ask me to speak on this. I really can preach on other subjects, and I do, but it does seem like this is a recurring theme. As I worked on today's message, it's actually this week and next week, I just realized, man, I thought I was, had two weeks. I'll be able to pack all this in. It's such a big subject that I'm sitting here going, oh my goodness, right? Am I going to be able to do all this? So some of the stuff we're going to talk about in eschatology, and eschatology is a word that basically, if you want to sum it up, it means end times, the study of end times prophecies, not prophecies that had to do with, you know, ancient Israel that already came true, but hi Elias, that's my grandson, by the way. <laughs> and I came at this particular subject, I, I've been involved in law enforcement for most of my adult life, right? And so I've been involved in writing hundreds of police reports, writing reports for judges, reading reports from other police officers and learning how to, man, get to the facts here, right? I want to know the facts. And sometimes people write in all these other comments that's like, no, just, just focus on the facts here. So I've come at this. You're the jury today and next week, and I'm just going to present information to you and you decide what you're going to do with that or, or you know, whether you accept kind of the premises that I'm going to be speaking. This study of eschatology does not have to do with your salvation, right? You don't have to believe this in order to go to heaven, you know, what you're going to hear. But I think if you want to be a fully rounded Christian, you need to know the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and to understand God's unfailing plan that's been revealed and laid out over time. So this is just a shameless plug for myself when I was a little younger here. I got to go to Israel with, in the Air Force with Pastor Dave Bessler, and so it really helped to open. I hope we can send Steve sometime and just a one-way ticket, right? Don't have him come back. But... You know, when you get to travel Israel and actually see the places these things happen, it kind of helps connect some of the stuff. So I'm hoping by the end of two weeks, you'll be able to understand what all of that means right there. So some of this stuff, I'm just going to, I'm not going to read everything up here because people have to get out of here at a certain time today for the run, and I don't want people falling asleep. So some of this, I'm just going to kind of give you a concise thing. If anybody wants these, sermon notes or the slides. If you give me your email address next week after Sunday service, I'll email them to you if you want to go back and look at them. But dispensationalism is basically the belief among some Christians, I'm one of them, that God has unveiled his plan to us in different stages since Adam and Eve, right? The first dispensation would be the dispensation of innocence. Adam and Eve are in the garden. They're walking with God and they have no shame and they have no sin and it ends in man's failure, Right? What do they do? They wind up sinning. God says, just don't do this one thing. They do that one thing. And over time, we've had these various dispensations. It's my belief that we're in the dispensation of grace, the church age, where grace has always existed, right? as it says up here, that even under Noah, it says, Noah found grace in the sight of the Lord. But just like in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was only given in certain levels, and that's why King David prayed, please don't take your Holy Spirit from me. We are now in a period where any believer is filled, has the Holy Spirit, all you're going to get. So we're in the dispensation of grace. In, according to my accounting and others, we're in the sixth dispensation, and then the seventh dispensation will be the millennial reign. Right? We'll talk about that in a little bit here. There are three predominant, within Christianity, views on the millennium. You have amillennials who say, now all these scripture verses about a thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ on earth are all just uh, figurative. They're, they're not literal. They're not taking prophecy literal. So they tend to look at prophecy as being more symbolic, and, and they don't see Jesus Christ physically returning. They, they believe in heaven and hell, but they don't believe that Jesus will reign on earth for a thousand years. A post-millennialist believes that Christianity and the gospel are going to just continue to spread over the globe, and everyone's going to get good, and then Christ is going to return. That sounds pretty ridiculous right now, doesn't it? Yeah. Things don't seem like they're going. So that was kind of the predominant view of the church, you know, five, six hundred years ago. And that's why 
they felt this need to you know, send out people exploring the world besides getting gold, right? But to spread the gospel and to evangelize people because then Christ is going to come. And under that viewpoint, we control it when Christ is going to come back, right? After a thousand gold, years of golden age of church. And then there's the correct view, my view, which is premillennialism, which says you can pretty much take the Bible and, and um, prophecy, literally, and that Jesus Christ is going to fulfill those prophecies and return to earth and rule from Jerusalem over the earth for a literal 1,000 years. And that would be the final dispensation. All right, we're going to get into this a little bit more. I, the first several slides have to be definitions, or else if we just jumped into the scripture verse, some of it wouldn't make sense. There's a view called preterism, which says that as you read like Matthew 24, where Jesus is telling the disciples about the end days, they say, okay, that was 32 AD roughly that Jesus was telling the disciples that those things all occurred in 70 AD, 40 years later. So a preterist would say, all those prophecies and things that you're reading about already occurred. And the reason they, I believe they get confused over that is because a lot of things that happen in the Bible, God gives a foreshadow of something greater that's going to happen later. So they see these things happening, the temple being burned, and they're like, that fulfilled that prophecy. But they have to do a real stretch with some of the things. They have to go, oh, that doesn't quite fit, so I've got to make that one fit or whatever. So Steve and I, Cyril, wouldn't hold to a preterist viewpoint. We believe that those things did happen kind of in a foreshadow, but they're foreshadowing something bigger that's going to come. And then there's this thing called replacement theology. It goes by some other names. But it basically says, and the church has gone by this, a lot of the mainline churches still go by this, that say whenever you read in the New Testament about Israel, it's really talking about the church, that we have replaced Israel and the Jewish people as the church. That's a wrong way of interpreting Scripture. When God says Israel and the it's Israel and the Jews. When he says the church, it's the church. God has different plans. He has various things. In, in, you know, there's three types of people today. You have the Gentile unbelievers, you have the church, and you have the Jewish people. And God has various plans are unfolding through those three types of people right now. The church has not replaced Israel. And if you just look at these two verses here, you know, where Paul is saying, hey, uh, God's not finished with Israel. If Israel's rejection of Jesus is a blessing for the Gentiles, the restoration of Israel will be more so. He's talking about the future. This is in you know, 40, 50 AD, the future restoration of Israel. And in Romans eleven twenty five, 25, it says, Lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, and in this way all Israel will be saved. So there's a point coming, the fullness of the Gentiles, where the last Gentile becomes a believer and joins the church, and then God says, now I'm going to turn my attention fully to the church, to uh, Israel. So replacement theology, in a lot of churches today, like the Lutheran, the Episcopalian, a lot of the Presbyterians, they still hold to this. And a lot of them, you know, th these mainline churches, they have these big retirement funds. I'm going to get into billions of dollars. I know, I grew up in the Episcopal church, and you know, they had billions and millions of dollars in their retirement funds. They're divesting from Israel right now. They're, they're saying, you know, we have money locked up in the stock market and stuff like that. Any company, Caterpillar, whatever, that's involved with Israel, we want them to pull the money out of our retirement fund because we don't want to support Israel. And that's a bad thing. They, you know, they're turning their back on Israel. And a lot of universities and stuff in America are doing the same because they think that the church has replaced Israel. Not going to go over all this, but if you really want to do your research, you can look back at the early church fathers, right? So you had the original 12 disciples and Paul, and then they discipled other people who became their disciples and went out on missionary journeys. The early disciples, the church fathers, they believed in a premillennial rapture of the church and also premillennialism, the actual literal uh, thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ. You know, if you read, whoops, sorry. If you read Polycarp and Justin Martyr here, you know, I've read some of their writings. You can go back and read some of the, the sermons that they wrote. Just some of them were discipled by the Apostle John. And they said, yeah, the Apostle John told us there'd be a literal thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ from Jerusalem. So it was after, you know, 300 AD or whatever that the church started changing some of their views on these things. But the early church believed 
in the things that we're teaching today. Okay, I, I've brought this up in other sermons, and I have to bring it up again. The reason I'm standing over here is to try to let you guys see, because if I stand here, you probably can't see, right? So I'm not hiding. I'm just trying to let the people over here see. When you study prophecy, you have to understand a lot of times there is a short-term prophecy and a long-term prophecy right next to it. Okay, so you, you have to understand that as you're studying it. Now, why is God doing that? So that when the short-term prophecy happens, you can be sure that the long-term prophecy is going to happen. <coughs> I don't have, I have an example, but one example that I'll give is that when Jesus is starting his earthly ministry, he's in a synagogue, and he goes in, they hand him the Isaiah scroll, and he reads it where it says, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to bring sight to the blind, and to announce God's favor upon man. And they wanted to take, and he said, this has been fulfilled today in your presence. He's saying, I am the Messiah, and I have just fulfilled this prophecy. And they were going to take him out, stone him, and he walked right through their midst, but the, the other sentence in that Isaiah prophecy, had he continued reading, says, and to announce the day of God's judgment. That's the long-term prophecy, just separated by a comma of a couple thousand years. So in 30 AD or so, he's saying, I just fulfilled this prophecy. That last sentence will be fulfilled in the future. But I'll give you another example from the Old Testament here. This is in Genesis with Abraham. And it says, sometime later, the Lord spoke to Abram in a vision and said to him, do not be afraid, Abram, for I will protect you and your reward will be great. But Abram replied, Lord, what good are all your blessings when I don't even have a son? Since you've given me no children, Eleazar of Damascus, a servant in my household, will inherit all my wealth. You have given me no descendants of my own, so, no, so one of my servants will be my heir. Then the Lord said to him, short-term prophecy, no, your servant will not be your heir, for you will have a son of your own who will be your, your heir. And Abram believed the Lord, and the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith. And then God continues. He says, as the sun was going down, Abram fell into a deep sleep. This is where God enters into a covenant with him. And a terrifying darkness came down over him. Then the Lord said to Abram, you can be sure that your descendants will be strangers in a foreign land where they will be oppressed as slaves for 400 years. But I will punish the nation that enslaves them, and in the end they will come away with great wealth. So he gives them the short-term prophecy. That's fulfilled like 15 years later when he has Isaac. And then he gives him the long-term prophecy. Your descendants are going to be slaves in Egypt for 400 years. Right? And that doesn't occur until much later. But I guarantee you that the Jewish people, or at least some of them, who were enslaved in Egypt later on, knew this prophecy. Right? That God does have a plan for us. This is what's happening. We don't like it. We're in slavery. But there's an end point coming up. And then he sends Moses to rescue him couple more definitions, and I kind of alluded to this already. Types and foreshadows. As you read the Old Testament or even the New Testament, you get the plain language of what God is trying to tell you. But a lot of times, there's also within that uh, even more showing God's handprint on the Bible, that this is amazing how he's done this, right? So there are kind of other messages within the Bible alluding to things that are going to happen in the future, so that when they happen, you're like, wow, God, you know, how did God do this within the Bible? And here's just a couple New Testament verses that kind of talk about that. In Romans it says, and ESV is the Bibles that we have in our pews here, it says, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who were sinning, was not like the transgression of Adam. Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. Adam was a type of Jesus Christ, right? Except he sinned, whereas Jesus, other verses go on to say, but unlike the first man, he didn't sin. Just as Adam brought death into the world, Jesus brought life into the world. And then in 1 Corinthians, it says, these things happened to them, talking about the Old Testament, as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. And further on in Hebrews, where it refers to, he's talking about the temple practices with all these specific things and the bowls and how, do, how can we do all this? He says it's only a copy or a shadow or for, of the real thing in heaven. You'll see an example here in just a second. Joseph in the Bible, and I, and I could literally just sit here and spend two months just going over types and foreshadows in the Bible, but Joseph is a type of Christ, and he's also foreshadowed Christ's life on earth. There's about 30 things I could have listed. I'm only going to put a couple here. Joseph, he was his father's special son, right? He had 12 sons, but he had a, a special love for him. Jesus, as we know, is beloved by his father. 
Joseph was rejected by his brothers. When he told them about his dreams and stuff, they were like, they rejected him. Jesus was rejected other than by his disciples, by the, the Jewish nation, his brothers. Joseph had a special coat that his dad made him. Jesus had a special robe, right, that the Roman soldiers didn't want to split. They actually gambled for it because it was, they, they were like, no, 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 let's not ruin it. It was actually held some worth. Joseph was sold for 30 pieces of silver. Jesus was sold for 30 pieces of silver. Not a coincidence. Joseph, his brothers were going to kill him. Then they said, no, 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 let's throw him down this pit here. And then they wind up taking him back out and selling him for slavery. That is a type of death. He was as good as dead when he went down in that pit. He, he couldn't get out on his own. And then he was res resurrected and brought back to life and then sold into slavery where he becomes uh, the second in command in Egypt. Jesus descended to the dead when he died or he rose to heaven. Joseph gave bread to save the world, right? He saved up all the grain. And so during the seven years of famine, he was able to save the world. Jesus said, I am the bread of life that's come down to bring salvation. And then Joseph winds up marrying a bride in Egypt, right? They were supposed to marry Jewish people, but he has to marry a Gentile bride. Jesus has married the church. We're referred to as the Gentile bride of Christ. So this is a type and a foreshadowing. These are not coincidences, coincidences, quinky dinks. This is what God does in the Bible in order to help show you, man, pay attention to what's going to happen here. And then, why a literal, literal interpretation of prophecy in the Bible? I'm not going to read each of these, but, you know, the 400-year prophecy in Egypt, exactly to the date. When the Jews were sent to Babylon for 70 years, it was exactly 70 years, as God had prophesied. Regarding the birth of the Messiah, all of the prophecies regarding Jesus' birth were fulfilled literally. They weren't fulfilled symbolically. And then the prophecies regarding the death of Messiah were literal too. These weren't, well, you know, symbolic or something like that. He literally fulfilled all of these things. Can you guys read that in the back? Just so I know for the future what font. No? Okay, well, I'm going to read some of them then. The, pro the bottom one, it says, prophecies regarding the death of Messiah were literal. Jesus would enter Jerusalem on a donkey, and he did. He would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. He would be beaten and whipped, which was Isaiah 53. His hands and feet would be pierced, and that was prophesied before there ever was crucifixion. And he would be buried in a rich man's cave, which exactly happened, right? So if all of these prophecies are fulfilled literally, then we should expect God's going to continue to fulfill prophecy literally and not all of a sudden switch to a non-literal interpretation. Here's a book I want to recommend, but it is not an easy read. It's Sir Robert Anderson's The Coming Prince. He was a lawyer and a believer in England, and he wound up being the head of Scotland Yard about 1880, 1890, during the time of Jack the Ripper. Very, very intelligent guy, and he wrote this, several books, but he wrote this book, The Coming Prince, and he writes it like a detective. And I'm telling you, the language in here, they were a lot smarter than we were <laughs> back then. They used their vocabulary. But he was able to outline all these things, you know, Daniel 70 weeks and all of this. And uh, he said, I don't know how it could possibly happen, but I believe Israel will be reborn as a nation. You're reading that in there and you get kind of chills because he's writing it 50 years before the nation of Israel is reborn. He's trying to speculate on how that could happen. He's like, I just don't know how that's going to happen. And then several years ago, I was shopping in a secondhand store and looking at their books and I this is going back quite a few years ago. I found this book called Haley's Bible Handbook. Anybody ever heard of that? It's like one of the first commentaries. Or hand it's, a, it's a small little handbook. I see people making signs here. It must be their favorite book, right? No. <laughs> but this was, it's been copyrighted numerous times over the years. The original version, I think, came out in 1910. And I happen to have, for 10 cents, at the secondhand store, one of the really old versions. So I'm reading the commentaries about the rebirth of the nation of Israel. And that guy is saying, I don't know how this can happen, but it's going to happen somehow. Literally, it's going to happen. So I remember reading these two books and going, wow, isn't that amazing how people viewed this just 40 or 30 years before it actually happened? They couldn't see it happening. So I'm going to tell you in your own life, if you're sitting here going, oh, I don't know how this could be, be aware, right? Things are happening in our lifetime and things will happen in our lifetime. So now we have the benefit living in 2016 of looking backwards on prophecy and realizing that in 1948, the nation of Israel was restored as a nation, even though nobody could have seen that happening. In Isaiah, I know you can't read this, but this Isaiah verse, it says, written 
700 BC or so? Who has ever heard of such a thing? Who has ever seen such things? Can a country be born in a day or a nation be brought forth in a moment? Isaiah was talking about the nation of Israel coming forth in one day, and that's exactly what happened on May 14th, 1948, when they voted and the nation of Israel was born, and then they went into war the very next day. So keep in mind that God has been fulfilling these things literally, even within our lifetime or the lifetime of our grandparents. So I talked about premillennialism. That's the literal thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ on earth. But within premillennialism, you also have the views of the rapture. Okay? You will not find the word rapture in the Bible, nor will you find the word trinity. There, there are Greek words that we've come up with to try to, to say what the Bible is saying here. Right? You have post-tribulation, which says that there's a final seven-year period of time for the Jewish people, and at the end of that seven-year terrible period of time, then God is going to rapture the church. Take them up, take them right back down again, come right back down. doesn't make sense to me. The mid-tribulation says that because that seven-year tribulation period is broken into three and a half years and three and a half years, they say the final three and a half years is the worst of the worst, the time of Jacob's trouble. And some people believe, well, the rapture will occur right before that, during that midpoint. And then those who are right-minded... <laughs> believe in a pre-tribulation rapture that says sometime in the near future right, that God is going to rescue his church out of the world and turn his attention fully on the Jewish people and the Jewish nation for a final seven-year period of time. Now, I mean, comes the evidence, and I'm going to do about 10 or so minutes of this, and whatever's left over, we're going to hit next week. So here's my evidence. I'm going to start in the Old Testament. Right? Enoch is the seventh from Adam, it says in Genesis 5, 21 through 24, I'm using the New Living Translation on this. It says, when Enoch was 65 years old, he became the father of Methuselah. After the birth of Methuselah, Enoch lived in close fellowship with God for another 300 years. He had other sons and daughters. Enoch lived 365 years, walking in close fellowship with God. Then one day he disappeared because God took him. Other words say translated, he was taken from this realm into the heavenly realm. He, without dying, he was taken. God doesn't do things happenstance, right? And just say, yeah, I'll take this guy. There's a reason he did it. Now we're reading in the New Testament about Enoch. It says, it was by faith that Enoch was taken up to heaven without dying. He disappeared because God took him. For before he was taken up, he was known as a person who pleased God. There's even archaeological evidence for this because in a recent dig, they found this old milk carton and it had a picture of Enoch on it and it said... <laughs> said possibly abducted by his father. So, so, you know, that was in Wikipedia, so you know it's true, right? But Enoch's son was named Methuselah, and his name Methuselah means his death shall bring. What a terrible name, right? I don't know what your name means, but my name's not that bad. Methuselah turns out to be the longest living person ever on the face of the earth, 969 years. And the very year that Methuselah dies is the year that Noah's flood comes. The prophecy was his name, his death shall bring the flood. So many people didn't believe that because we know that as Noah was preaching or whatever, Enoch is raptured before the flood and then Noah and his family go through the flood. They're symbolic of the Jewish nation going through the tribulation and Enoch is symbolic of the church being taken out before God's wrath. Right? We're not just talking about natural disasters, we're talking about God's wrath being poured out on the earth and Enoch representing the church being taken out before that happens. Enoch and Noah both had the extraordinary distinction of walking with God. They were referred to as people that walked with God. You can, if you can see. Do we need to turn these lights out, maybe? I don't know if that would help. But Enoch is a foreshadow of the church, but you know, it says Noah walked with God. He wasn't raptured. Why? Because he represents the Jewish people during this time. You know, as I was talking to Bill Wren before today's service, I'm talking to him about how this, I just got so much information, I've had to cut out a lot of the evidence. And that happens a lot of times in a jury trial. You're thinking, I can't overwhelm the jury with too much evidence, They're just gonna, their mind is not going to... I actually, for sake of time, had to cut a lot out. And as I was talking to him, I remembered one more thing I forgot to put in here. I want to go back to Sodom and Gomorrah. I don't have a slide on this. But Lot is Abram's nephew. Right? He, it says in the New Testament he's a godly person. He's living in Sodom, 
And God tells Abraham, I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. I'm going to pour out my wrath upon them because of all their years of wickedness. And Abram says, good Jew, he's, he's negotiating here, right? He says, what if there's 50 righteous people? What if there's 40? What if there's 30? And he finally gets down to 10. God says, if there's 10 righteous people, I won't destroy it because of the 10. But they couldn't even find 10. So God r rescues Lot and his two daughters and the wife, and he winds up destroying them. They're a foreshadow of the church being taken out before God's wrath is being poured out. So let's move on here. This in itself should be a three-week sermon, and I'm going to try to highlight it in about three minutes here. I want to encourage you to get these slides or to go back and read these verses. In Leviticus 23, God lays out seven feasts that the Jewish people are supposed to keep for all time. There was never an end time they were supposed to stop celebrating these. Hanukkah is not part of it. That's a, that's a, you know, a celebration they have, whatever. But the seven feasts are Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, Pentecost, trumpets, Day of Atonement, tabernacles. The first four occur in the spring, and they're very specific when they're to occur. And for about 1,500 years, the Jewish people were celebrating these feasts, and then they were fulfilled in Christ. Not only did they have a practical reason for doing it, these were to remind the people of their provision, right? They would have the first harvest feast, and they would thank God for sending the rain and the harvest and the food and asking for, to, to sustain them for the following year. But they also had a rehearsal for something greater. As you can see, the word moed in Hebrew means feast. It means rehearsal. Not only was it a feast like, you know, we celebrate Jesus' birth, Christmas, but these were rehearsals of something greater that was going to happen later. Well, it turns out, and again, God doesn't do things by coincidence or happenstance, that Jesus is crucified at Passover, and during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, they run together. Unleavened bread signifies without sin. First fruits happens that holiday right on the day Jesus is resurrected from the dead. And what does the New Testament say? He's the first fruits of those who are resurrected, who are born from the grave. And then 50 days later, we have the Feast of Weeks. That's what the Jewish people call it. We have Pentecost. The church is born exactly on that day. So God has fulfilled these, prophetically, these four spring feasts. Again, maybe sometime in the future, I'll pre I've preached on this before, but there's a lot more to this. Now we're in the church age, 2,000 years where God says, go out and make disciples and harvest. But there's a time coming where these fall feasts are going to be fulfilled prophetically. Okay? The Feast of Trumpets is known as Rosh Hashanah. That's tomorrow in Israel time, according to Cyril. I thought it might have been today, but it's tomorrow. And that is called the Feast of Trumpets. It's a happy celebration. And interestingly enough, you don't know exactly what day it's going to happen on because it requires the sighting of the new moon by two reliable witnesses, and then they report, and then they figure out exactly what day Rosh Hashanah. Will. So when Jesus says no one man knows the exact hour or day, he's alluding to Rosh Hashanah. Because it takes that year. You know about the time period it's going to occur, but you don't know the exact day. Then you have the Day of Atonement. When the Jewish people had their temple, that was the one day of the year where the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies and make offerings for the people. It's a very sad, it's a day of mourning. It's a day where you confess your sins as a Jewish person. And then the final feast is the Feast of Tabernacles. So they still celebrate this in Israel today. You actually build tents or booths up on top of your house, and you live in it for you know, 10 days or whatever to remind you that we're, we're pilgrims here on this earth, that this is not our permanent home, that we will eventually be with God. Much more to this, but that's just the, the quick version. The feast had several purposes, as I said, but from a dispensational viewpoint, those of us who are pre-trib, believe that these things are about to be fulfilled in the near future, right? That we equate Rosh Hashanah with the Feast of Trumpets. And I'm going to give you a little bit more evidence for that in just a little bit here. The rapture of the church may occur on Rosh Hashanah. Very possible. In 1 Corinthians, these are primary rapture verses here. In the New Testament, 1 Corinthians, Paul says, Let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. We will not all die. But we will all be transformed. It will happen in a moment, in the blink of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown. For when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever, and we who are living will also be transformed, or raptured, 
For our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die, and our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. Continuing on in Thessalonians, it says, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God. First, the believers who have died will rise from their graves, then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we will be with the Lord forever. So encourage each other with these words. People that are post-tribulationists say, no, 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 no. The rapture can't occur until after the seven-year period of time because they're talking about trumpets here, the last trumpet. Because if you read the book of Revelations, the final judgments that are being poured out are being announced by these trumpets. This is different. This is talking about two different types of trumpets here, like a wedding feast. Okay, when In the old days in, in ancient Israel, if a man and woman were being engaged and the parents were involved, they would blow a trumpet announcing this engagement. There would be a party, whatever. And then during the next however long period of time they had this engagement, if people asked the bridegroom, when's the marriage taking place? He would say, only my father knows. Why? Because all the preparations have to be made. My father will know the exact date of the wedding. Talking about also a foreshadowing of the church. Don't know the exact day. What would the bridegroom do during this time? He would build a house onto his father's house, an insula. He would actually build another room. If you go to ancient Israel, I think I have a picture later. I was actually able to go to Capernaum to where St. Peter's house is. They know this is St. Peter's house right here. And you can stand over it with the glass and you can see St. Peter was married, right? And you can see where his brothers and sisters added onto this house. They have these insulas. So that's when Jesus says, I go back to prepare a place for you, and I'll make a room for you, and I'm going to come back and get you as a bridegroom is going to get his bride. So when the father blew the final trumpet, that's when the marriage was taking place. Okay? Now the son knew. He could see everything's done. Dad's going to blow the trumpet here pretty soon, whatever. But they didn't tell the other people exactly when the next time the trumpet would be sounded. And I'm going to go over two more verses, and then we're going to stop, because I already saw that Mandy and Jason had to leave, and then this is where we're going to end it, and we'll pick it up again next week. Second Thessalonians, Paul continues, he says, Do you not remember that when I was with you, I told you these things? He had taught the Thessalonian church in probably three to four weeks everything he could think of about God. Steve and I were talking earlier. I have met, I have preached similar sermons to this in other churches where I've had lifelong churchgoers come up to me and say, I'm 75 years old. It's the first time I've ever heard of this. Right? That shouldn't be. You should, if Paul can teach the Thessalonians in one month everything about God that he could possibly think of, including the rapture, then our churches should be preaching on this as well. He says, they were scared because some people came and said, oh, you missed it. The rapture already happened. Jesus already came. They're like, what? We, we missed it. How did that happen? So Paul clarifies. He says, you know what is restraining him, the Antichrist, now so that he may be revealed in his time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it. Who restrains sin? Who restrains the Antichrist? It's the Holy Spirit. And where is the Holy Spirit? In us, the church. Okay. He'll do so until he's taken out of the way. How's the Holy Spirit taken out of the way? He, God's not, he said he's going to be in us forever. He's not going to take, take him out of us. He's going to take us out of the world. And then the lawless one, the Antichrist, will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan, with all power and false signs and wonders, and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing, because they refuse to love the truth and to be saved. Therefore God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false in order that all may be condemned who do not believe. You know, there are, we don't give up on anybody, right? If, if we have an opportunity to share the good news with somebody, we do. But at times, you can even see in the Bible, like with Pharaoh, where God is sending all these signs and, and Pharaoh says, all right, all right, you can leave. No, 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 you're gonna stay, you're not going. And it keeps saying that Pharaoh hardened his heart. And all of a sudden you get to about somewhere on the midpoint, it says God hardened his heart. It's almost like God said, I'm done with you. You're still alive, and I'm going to use you for my purposes, but I'm done with you. You've hardened your heart, now I'm hardening your heart. And that happens with some people. I'm the walking dead, right? Soon to start up again, right? Pretty soon. <laughs> but God is saying, you know what? I mean, think of this. Living in America, we all have 10 Bibles in our church, five 
you know, radio stations we could turn to, churches everywhere we can go hear the message, and people don't want to hear the truth. God says, all right, I'll send you a strong delusion when this happens then, and you're not going to know what's going on. I'm going to end here, but where it says the lawless one is by the activity of Satan, you know, I've highlighted before in some other sermons some of the terrible things happening in our country, and I'll, I'll just leave you with one that really kind of breaks my heart. About a week and a half ago, uh, Jonathan Kahn, the writer of the book, The Harbinger, that I did a sermon on, he's in New York City. If you want to YouTube this, just do Jonathan Kahn, uh, it's about a five-minute video, Arch of Baal, right? Ancient Baal. He's in New York City, and this is about a week ago, and he's standing there talking, saying, you know what? We have been turning from God for decades in this country, and now we've started desecrating the things of God. I preached a sermon on that recently. And he goes, now, just like ancient Israel, after they desecrated the things of God, they started worshiping Baal. And he turns, and there, by New York City, City Hall, where our first government was, they unveil the Arch of Baal in New York City about a week ago. They, ISIS had destroyed it in Palmyra, Syria, and we just rebuilt it here in America. So now we've just invited Beelzebub, Baal, the Lord of the Flies, Satan. We've just created an altar to him officially in our country. So these signs and wonders, right, in our country, you're going to see, unfortunately, more evil. But where evil abounds, grace abounds more. Amen, right? So, guys, I wish I could keep going, but for sake of time, we've got to stop, and then hopefully I can finish the other 30-something slides we have next week, whatever. So let's close in prayer, and then I'll let you go. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, God, that in our generation, you've given us the ability to look back over history and time and, and just have our faith increase by seeing your word being played out, Lord, over the centuries and even now in our own lifetime. Lord, help us to have stout hearts and to stand firm and to know that you do have a grand and, and great plan for us, Lord, that wherever you are, we will be with you forever. I pray for our nation, Lord that you would send revival. God, especially amongst our young generation who have grown up without knowing you, I pray that you would send a mighty revival, Lord, in these last days to, to stir up the hearts and the minds of the people to turn back to you. Help us to reject the evil, Lord, that's so encompassing us. And I pray, God, that you would just uh, work in each of our lives and help us to be strong and to, to have fellowship with each other. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.